Right, so this next video is all about what happens after glycolysis, uh, and it's something we're going to call it pyruvate oxidation. Pyruvate oxidation. And it's a very important step. Oxidation. Very important step, uh, because something really uh, important happens in this important step. So let's we'll draw our little pyruvate molecule. Let me just draw the pyruvate molecule from before. So this is what we ended up with from our from our uh, glycolysis in the last video. This cute little molecule called pyruvate. And we got this molecule by basically taking a six carbon sugar glucose and breaking it apart now remember we got two of them right there's actually two of them so we can put our little times two over here because glycolysis broke up one six carbon sugar into these two three carbon molecules called pyruvates and that therefore we would get two of these from every molecule of glucose so kind of we'll do all of the bookkeeping after but uh, for now, we're just going to remember that there's two of these pyruvates. Now, here's what's interesting. All of what we've done so far, write this down somewhere, all of glycolysis has taken place in the cytosol of the cell. The cytosol is the solution. Typically, uh, in grade 9, you call it the cytoplasm, but that's actually not quite accurate. The cytoplasm refers to the entire internal structure of the cell, all of it. So the cytosol is really the, the juicy liquid that everything floats in inside the cell. So all of, um, all of uh, the glycolysis reactions that we did before happen in the cytosol. But I'm going to draw a line here, a red line, I guess, maybe a purple line. Um, I'm going to draw sort of like a membrane with a little protein in it here. A little protein gate. So out here is the cytosol. And that's where the pyruvate has accumulated because of the breaking down of glucose. This particular membrane here is the mitochondrial membrane. Now it's actually a double membrane. Uh, so perhaps I should draw, I'm not going to draw two membranes, that's kind of silly. But it's, it's a double membrane, so there's actually another membrane sort of out here, like this. The mitochondria has, it's an outer membrane with another mem inner membrane all wound inside. And so what has to happen is that in order to get combined with, um, or to, to go on to the next step, we have to get inside the mitochondria, in the mitochondria. And to do that, we have to get this pyruvate through this membrane. The problem is, pyruvate is a charged molecule. It's got that little negative O there at the top. And charged molecules don't go through nonpolar membranes very well. So we're going to have to transport it across. We're going to have to use some energy to get it into the cell. Do you have a question? Come here. What's interesting about this is, this is one of the steps that we are still not 100% certain as to how it goes on completely. We know most of the details. But obviously, energy has to be used to transport this pyruvate across. And so somehow, there has to be some kind of way to activate that protein gate. And as of yet, as far as I'm aware, I don't think anybody has worked out the fine details of exactly where this energy comes from, if it comes from ATP, how much ATP. So this represents sort of a little bit of we still don't know in biology, which is kind of cool. There's a lot of things we still don't know. So if you're looking for a graduate thesis, this could be it. Um, but somehow, a number of reactions occur that get the pyruvate to cross from where it is into the mitochondria. So now we are now inside the mitochondria, or mitochondrion, one of them. So that's an important thing to remember, okay? What takes place where? Now, what happens to the pyruvate is kind of complicated. So all I'm going to do is not try to squeeze it in on this picture. 
I'm going to make a new picture. And we won't worry about the mitochondrial membrane in this picture because it just makes everything kind of complicated. So I'm going to just redraw the pyruvate again. All right, so, uh, whoops. So here's my pyruvate molecule. And so what's going to happen is we're going to, we're going to draw this arrow and a number of things are going to occur. Now the pyruvate crosses the membrane and once it's crossed the membrane, all of this happens. Okay. So if you look at the top of this right here, you'll see there's a C with two O's, this carboxyl group. It's pretty much been oxidized as much as it can. There's not very many things that are going to be able to pull away electrons from those two oxygens, right? So there's not much else that can be done to this. And so what happens is it sort of gets ejected as a carbon dioxide molecule. This is the first time we see carbon dioxide produced. Remember how one of the products of, of uh, respiration is carbon dioxide, right? Well, here's the first little bit of CO2. And so you can see how those two O's in that C could, could form a carbon dioxide molecule and be popped off of this molecule. So far, so good. Now that would leave us, if we sort of, if we think about what would be left, it would be this little C with a double bond O and then this C, H3. But obviously something has to attach to this. You can't just have this C without that that hand holding on to another molecule. So guess what? There's a molecule that happens to be pretty much everywhere, and that, of course, is water. So if we take a water molecule and we break it apart, which can easily be done, right? The old water dance. Then the oxygen from this water molecule, whoops, uh, black, the oxygen from this water molecule can be attached here like that. So that's where the oxygen goes. And now we've created something called acetate, another molecule. Acetate. So far, so good. Then what happens is we have our friend NAD come along. NAD plus will swoop in, swoop out. On the way out, what, what it's basically going to do is it's going to um, become Oh, get the right lines and the right colors. It's going to become an NADH and an H plus. And so that's where the two H's end up from the water. We can kind of go, oh, look at that. See the two H's there. And so we've, we've, we've had this little interplay or exchange which elevates the molecule to a whole other state. Then, there's another character in this at the same time, another player. And he's a big molecule, and he's called, he's called coenzyme A. Acetyl-CoA is what we're going to make. So there's a molecule called coenzyme A. He's a very big, large molecule made of protein. So we can't draw him because he's ridiculously large. Uh, but we can just use a little symbol, CoA. I think they put a dash in there. That with a circle, that will mean uh, this coenzyme A. All right? And so this coenzyme A comes along and also attaches to the acetate. And so the end result is this. I'll put a big arrow here. 
But the end result of all this interacting produces this molecule which has the uh, enzyme attached at the top. So we'll have, and it's attached by a, a sulfur molecule. It contains a sulfur and CoA, like that. Um, and then we have a very weak bond. Let me get a smaller line here. This CoA is very weakly attached. Right? It, it's, a, it's a sort of an association, more of a bond. The electrons are pushing and pulling, and it's, it's kind of hanging out there. But it's such a weak bond that it's very easily broken. And what that means, of course, is that by attaching itself there, it puts the whole molecule in a highly energized state. Because all it will take now is the slightest pop, the slightest push, the slightest breath of fresh air. And that thing will start reacting and falling apart. So the attachment of this creates a very powerful, or very energized, I should say, molecule. And it looks like this. And its name is acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA. That's the guy right there. And he's the end result. Question. All right, let's summarize what's actually happened here in, in a way that's a little bit easier to understand. I'm going to omit the acetate step. That's an intermediate step. So what I'm going to show is that the pyruvate molecule, which we didn't label, but that's over here, pyruvate. And remember, this is times two, because two pyruvates are made for every glucose, right? Okay, so we're going to make a summary, and we're going to skip the, the acetate step. So we're going to start with pyruvate, and we're going to show what pyruvate becomes. It essentially becomes acetyl-CoA. So we're going to have the, this end molecule right here, and this start molecule over here, and an arrow. And then on the arrow, we're going to show the two important things, the three important things that happen. A carbon dioxide is released right there. Uh, an NADH is formed here, and a coenzyme A is used up or enters into the, the, uh, the situation. So the summary of all this would look something like this. We take... Um, Pyruvate, pyruvate, so C, O, double bond O, double bond O, CH3, get rid of that dot that formed there. Uh, there's our pyruvate. And so, uh, you know what, I didn't go down enough, so let me just erase up here for a second. We have some space. There we go. Actually, I'll use a thicker arrow for that. So here's the arrow or the reaction. And the end result of all that jiggling around is the acetyl-CoA, which has the lightly attached coenzyme A with that squiggly weak bond attached to uh, acetate molecule. Right? And acetate, by the way, is, is also what we call acetic acid, right? It's vinegar. It's a common molecule. So what has to happen here is a couple of things. One, out of this reaction, a CO2 is formed. So we'll put CO2 coming off the reaction like that. We also have an NAD plus going into the reaction and then coming out as the new NADH plus H plus over here. Okay, I'll fix that. Oops, too big. NADH and H plus. I can't get that plus to look like a plus for some reason today. H plus, there we go. And the third thing, of course, in order to make this happen, in order to get this coenzyme A, it has to enter the equation. So we write coenzyme A enters. So we're going to use this format a lot to show what enters and leaves at each step. So don't be sloppy about it. Don't draw the red arrow like that. 
this is supposed to show that it goes into the reaction, and the blue shows that it comes out. The green shows that it goes in and comes out changed as something different. Yeah. So this is what you would show on your test, yeah. This is what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to show for this step, right? No, and don't forget, uh, if you want to indicate in some way that all of this happens after the pyruvate is transported across the mitochondrial membranes. That says mitomembrane, right? The transport has to happen. And as I said, there's, there's still uh, details to be worked out in terms of how much energy it actually takes. And so when we do our accounting of energy after, we're going to find that we can't say precisely how much ATP this process makes, but we can give a range because there are lots of little details that haven't been filled in. So that is the pyruvate oxidation step. And now we're going to see what happens to this acetyl-CoA because it's going to enter a whole new chain of reactions called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. That'll be the next video.